All right, continuing the discussion on cranial nerves, the next question is that why cranial nerve 6 is the most commonly affected with raised intracranial pressure. Uh, so the 6th cranial nerve is the abducens nerve. The job of the 6th cranial nerve is to uh, activate the lateral rectus muscle. The lateral rectus muscle is on the outside of the eyeball. When it's contracted, it pulls the eyeball outwards. So the left lateral rectus will pull the eyeball towards the left and right will pull the right eyeball towards the right. Uh, it is called the, the abduction of the eye, of you know, especially one eye with disconjugation of the two eyes, is considered a false localizing sign. It's called false localizing sign because it does not localize into the brain uh, where other cranial nerve does. It, lo it, it is due to uh, damage or pressure of the nerve itself, uh, the sixth cranial nerve, uh, and is often the main sign or main cranial nerve uh, involved when the intracranial pressure goes up with you know hydrocephalus or increased intracranial fluid and the question is that why sixth cranial nerve and there are two reasons uh, one reason is that the sixth cranial nerve is considered one of the longest uh, it may not be the longest but it's one of the longest cranial nerve uh, it's the only cranial nerve i believe and i might be wrong now i think i'm right which actually uh, loops around the seventh nerve nucleus and exits on the back and then turn around the side of the brain stem, I think, you know, midbrain, and goes up towards the front where it has to go on the sides of the pituitary gland to um, go keep going straight. And then there's the cavernous sinus, and on the outer wall, the cavernous sinus keeps going into the uh, orbit uh, from the orbital fissure it enters in there uh, to come in. So it's a really long path. That's one reason given, but I think the more appropriate reason is that as it comes out of the brain, curls around and goes straight up to go uh, along the pituitary gland uh, and go along the side of the cavernous uh, sinus um, to, to go towards the eye, it is coming from the posterior fossa or back of the brain into the middle fossa where there is the uh, middle uh, of the brain and uh, uh, the there is what is called the uh, temporal bone and there is what is called the petrous part of the temporal bone which forms like a mountain like Himalayas so these mountains or apex of the petrous temporal bone is forming like these boundaries between posterior fossa and, and middle fossa and the nerve has to climb up and cross over the apex of the petrous temporal bone to enter on the walls of the cavernous sinus in the middle fossa. So it's going from the posterior earth to the middle earth uh, by climbing over the mountains of petrous uh, temporal bone. And it's vulnerable there to pressure. So it's sitting right at the apex, which is not very sharp, but is you know pointed uh, right there. And if there's something pressing on top of it, uh, such as the brain coming down and pressing on the nerve, uh, then it can uh, get swollen over there because of that pressure or maybe the spinal fluid itself can press onto it from the top, pushing it against the bone. And that probably is the reason why it gets often affected by the increase in trickling pressure and can present as a false localizing sign. Um, next, some questions are related to smell and taste. The questions include why most of the people have loss of sense of smell and taste. So I'm assuming we're talking about general population. We know that in elderly, the loss of sense of uh, smell is a very common phenomenon. And it is often the most common cause of loss of sense of smell is trauma. So a very simple trauma can break those fine fibrils that connect the, uh, the optic uh, or the olfactory bulb with the mucosa. So olfactory nerve actually is not a single nerve. It's actually 15 to 20 tiny nerves or fibrils is the, probably the better word that are kind of fi forming these threads that go from the olfactory bulb down into the mucosa at the top of the nose and the area is called cribriform plate because it's poked by these 15, 20 holes for the fibrils to go down. So the nerve length uh, if you put all these, uh, so the camera is only one to two millimeter. It's traveling very, very small distance, crossing a bony plate to go from the mucosa where the receptors are 
up into the olfactory bulb, not as a single bundle, but 15, 20 fibrils. And it's very, very sensitive to shear damage. Shear means that if there are two things that are on top of each other and attached with, with something in the middle, if they slip on each other, then the connection between the two is being sheared is being separated by the sliding, not by pulling, but by sliding. So if the brain jerks forward because of a coup or counter coup injury, because of a sudden break on the car or hitting your head or something, then the brain can move too fast uh, to a point where the nerve gets sheared off. Also, you can have fracture of the cribriform plate in a punch to the nose or to the face that that bone is the thinnest part of the base of the brain is that's why if the bone breaks, if there's too much pressure on the bone and the bone is twisting to a point where it cannot handle any more and something's going to break, then the weakest part of the frontal bone is the cribriform plate and that's why it will break over there. And that's why the CSF coming out of the nose because of the break over there, CSF rhinonia is, is a common symptom that we could see in a trauma, blunt trauma to the face like punch or kick or, or hitting the head on the, on the dashboard with a car accident injury. So for, that re for those two reasons, trauma is the most common cause of uh, loss of sense of smell in population, usually elderly population, you have had longer life to have those traumas. And it could be even multiple minor traumas that you don't revolve. So many patients who probably have traumatic loss of sense of smell actually don't have a history of trauma. You cannot re they cannot remember one single trauma that you, you can say, okay, this is, sounds like bad enough to be cause of this loss of sense of smell. Now, um, however, the most common pathological cause of loss of sense of smell is actually Alzheimer's disease. So this dementia that starts after 65 years of age in most people, not everyone, uh, often affects olfactory bulb and olfactory nerves in the same process, the tauopathy or uh, amyloid plaques and things like that in the brain and then cause loss of sense of smell. Now the most uh, unique or unusual cause of sense of smell or, or very specific to loss of sense of smell before COVID era was Parkinson's disease. So Parkinson's patient often have a loss of sense of smell, 80 to 90% in, in many studies. Uh, and that's where we usually think of as loss of sense of smell, but it's the third on the list, right? Most common is trauma, but most common pathology, neurodegenerative disorder is Alzheimer, but most significant one, most specific one, is uh, because most Alzheimer patients don't have, so it's, so it's not as common as in Alzheimer as it is in Parkinson, it's just that there's more Alzheimer's patient. Um, now with COVID era, it seems like probably the most common cause of sense of smell, acute loss of sense of smell in all ages is COVID-19 infection. And the, there are some questions related to that. Uh, what COVID do with sense of smell? It's gone along with the taste, which often we think are related. And how is it affected by COVID-19? And then someone said that uh, since there is loss of sense of smell, maybe it's a sign that the olfactory nerve is involved. And that is right. We believe that the COVID-19 virus is a neurotrophic virus. It attaches to nerve endings and is taken up by the brain. There are known cases of encephalitis with COVID-19. There are known cases of uh, brain involvement. And, you know, it's not as common as a loss of sense of smell. So maybe the spirit doesn't go up too far, but we do think that the olfactory nerves are involved. But And, and you have to remember that the port of entry for COVID-19 is, is nose. And that's why they say often nose washing frequently may help reduce the amount of virus burden, may not completely prevent the infection, but can make the severity of the disease less. By They say that the amount of viruses you get, inoculation, the, the bigger they inoculate, the more viruses there are, the severe the disease. I don't know how true that is, but that's one th thought I have. And then there's one related question is that can a person lose sense of smell from any systemic disease like hypothyroidism? Uh, probably, you know, I don't have a good grasp on the list of causes of loss of sense of smell, but, you know, clearly having a runny nose or a flu or a common cold or anything, anything that blocks a nasal function could easily cause loss of sense of smell. But beyond that, you know, I'm not, I can't recall uh, off the top of my head. Pretty good.